So it's gonna be really hard to do a whole video about solo war game without making any playing with yourself jokes. Anyway, I'm Anders. Let's talk some hobby. Hello. So, uh, quick interruption uh, before we watch the video. I just wanted to let you know that there's actually going to be an announcement at the end of this one. So, just if you wanted to stick around until after the uh, the uncredit cards, um, yeah, there's going to be a going to be a little announcement about uh, about the channel. So, uh, stick around. And in uh, the meantime, uh, well, you know, enjoy the, uh, the 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 video. See ya. So, spoiler alert, if you didn't read the title of the video, there's going to be a Middle Earth strategy battle game battle report at the end of this video. So, if you're just here for that, skip to the time below, and for the rest of you, let's talk. For anyone watching the future, let's put this into some context. I'm filming this in the summer of 2020, so that means COVID-19. While here in Canada it is looking a lot better than other places, and some stuff is going back to more or less normal, I mean, I even had a little tournament with some friends at my place a couple weeks ago. The government also just made masks mandatory at most indoor places, and there was actually recently a big spike in cases in my town, so we still have a ways to go. And because of that, it's probably still going to be a while before we can all feel comfortable playing war games together again. So it's still a great time to look at the world of solo war gaming. But what if you don't want to play a new solo game? What if you just want to play your favorite game? What if you want to play 40k or a Song of Ice and Fire or Star Wars Legion or Middle Earth Strategy Battle game by yourself? Well, you're in luck, because today I'm going to be going over my tips for adapting any multiplayer war game for solo play. And I've organized it into an internet-friendly ordered list, because top five lists are how everything works now, so all right. Number one, why? So the first thing to consider when trying to figure out how to play a war game solo is why? Well, I was never the most popular kid in school, and I did get really good at painting, so no, n not like that. That's, that's too real. I mean, why do you want to play a multiplayer war game solo? What are you looking to get out of it, as there may be some alternatives? Are you looking for a challenge? Then you're probably just better off playing a video game. And if you arrange stuff with your friends, you can even get the socializing element out of it. Or maybe it's the particular theme or lore for the game, but in that case, there's usually some other kind of media that you can get that hit from. For instance, 40k. There's not this game, there's multiple books, there's videos online, and I think there's even comic book coming out for it now. Even just wanting that tactile experience isn't really enough, as there's tons of different solo war games and board games out there that you can get a physical experience out of. So the main reason I can see why to play a particular game that's supposed to be played multiplayer solo is because you enjoy the specific mechanics. For instance, I have copies of both Descent and Journeys of Middle Earth, both of which can be played solo, and Journeys is even Lord of the Rings. But I just love the mechanics and systems of the Middle Earth strategy battle game and feel they're so comfortable that for me it was worth it. Number two, what kind of game do you want? Next, you need to figure out what kind of game you're looking to play, as the experience is not going to be like playing with someone else. We'll go more into this later, but a big part of solo wargaming is controlling both sides of the battle, and so playing a full-scale army game is just going to get tedious. Also, going back to the challenge question, you're never going to get that same head-to-head -head competitions playing solo, so it's better to structure it a little bit. The best way of going forward, I find, is to really lean into the narrative and scenario elements of the game, as that not only gives you a good structure to work from, but also helps to determine any behavior should the algorithms fail. This will also help to balance your games, as most scenarios will give each side different objectives to complete. So, it's not just bashing armies against each other, which really doesn't work single player. Looking at the Middle Earth strategy battle game again, there's lots of scenarios in the books that would really adapt well to solo play. Also, due to the nature of the story, a lot of them involve a small group of heroes facing off a larger horde of enemies, which again, works really nicely in this structure. The best resource for this by far is the Battle Companies books, as they not only include a huge list of scenarios specifically for smaller games, but they also have extra rules for adding role-playing elements to your games and even narrative scenarios that are ready to go. 
You can even see this kind of implementation in some official solar rules for war games. For instance, Games Workshop had put out solar rules for their Warhammer Underworlds game, and rather than having two sides facing off each other, it's actually one side taking down a bigger monster. I even think they did something similar to Warcry, but don't quote me on that. Number three, automation. And so now we actually have to look at how we are going to automate these, and for that, it's going to be flowcharts. Basically, we need to determine a flowchart for each enemy model's turn in order to determine what they will do. To do this, we simply need to walk through what an individual's turn might look like and make small decisions in advance as to what they're going to do. For instance, in narrative scenarios, there's usually some kind of objective that they're trying to achieve, and usually it's better to focus on that rather than just killing the enemy. So taking that into consideration, a flowchart for that kind of movement might look something like this. Is there an objective within the model's move distance? Yes? Go to the objective. No. Can you charge an enemy? Yes. Charge the enemy. No. Which is closer? Enemy or objective? Objective. Move towards the objective. Enemy. Move towards the enemy. And that's basically it. Just go through what can happen during a turn and prioritize it. While this example is very simple, it will work for a simple foot soldier and is actually what I used in my test game. For a full game, you'd really have to go through and add more rules for missile weapons, but to do that, you again simply just need to go through the same step-by-step -step process. Number four, what do we get rid of? So next, we need to talk about what to drop. We talked about automation before, but the reality is there's a lot of elements in these games that we really just can't do that with. As war games are primarily designed to be competitive, they offer lots of little options and decisions to be made. But these rely on contemplation and thinking, which we can't reliably automate. So it means we have to determine what systems to keep and what to get rid of. Looking at the middle of the strategy battle game again and going through a few of the systems, it really shows us what does and doesn't work. Firstly, combat basically wouldn't change as once you're engaged in it, it more or less goes the same way every time. Dual roll, wound roll. However, looking at something like might is a bit different as that how you use or don't use your might usually ends up winning you the game and it's never obvious we'd never be able to reliably determine a system for when and when not to call a heroic action, or when and when not to use a might point in the combat, so all of that is right out. And so just like that, we basically have to go step by step through each different kind of game mechanic and determine what can and can't be automated. This of course goes for other games too, as looking at something like the Song of Ice and Fire miniature game by Cool Mini or not, while you absolutely could automate the troop movement, you would never be able to actually automate the card or NCU play. However, this doesn't mean that these mechanics are just out of the game, it just means that the automated troops can't use them. To add to the gameplay and challenge, you should still be using these special rules even if the enemy can't, and just try to balance out the game by adjusting the points values or the objectives. Number 5. What if it doesn't work? Finally, what happens if something just doesn't work? For instance, if you have a model you simply don't know what to do with, even with your algorithm, a good rule of thumb I find is to do whatever is worse for the controlling players. This usually leads to a more exciting outcome and adds to the challenge. But if it's really not working in that the games just aren't fun, well, we're kind of back to the beginning. As I mentioned, there's tons of solo games out there that are designed from the ground up to be that way, and so should be more immediately entertaining. For instance, I've been really interested in giving Rangers of Shadow Leaf a try, as that's supposed to be great. Also, it's a miniature agnostic game, so I can use whatever models I want from my current collection. Also, since it's just a standard fantasy environment, if I really wanted to, I could just apply a layer of Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones on top of that, so I can again justify using the models I have and still enjoy those lore and worlds. However, it's really just great to try new games in general as it's really easy to get stuck in with your favorites. Get to see new mechanics, new lore, and potentially paint some great new models at the same time. Also, a lot of these games are from smaller publishers who are great to support as, remember, it's not just Games Workshop out there. And so, by following these simple tricks, you should have all the tools you need to adapt whatever war game you have into solo play. Or like, you know, just play something else. Also, just to show I'm not totally full of it, as I know that a lot of this just kind of sounds like bullshit, I've got something special for you. My first battle report. Sit back, relax, grab a beer, coffee, whatever. Let's go. Fellowship is no more. The ring bearer 
is gone. And the three hunters must now pursue the Uruks who broke them in order to save their friends. This journey brings them to the Kingdom of Rohan, where they have come across a small village that has been attacked by Saruman's forces. While the hobbits are still in danger, our heroes cannot condemn these innocent townspeople to death and decide to fend off the attackers. In this scenario, the three hunters who will face off against the warband of Uruks, including three berserkers, six scouts, and 18 Urukai warriors. The heroes win if they manage to break the Uruks by killing two thirds of them, and the evil horde will win if they either burn down all four of the buildings or kill all three hunters. The game ends immediately as soon as one side achieves their objective. The model begins and ends its turn in contact with the building without performing any other actions such as moving, shooting, or fighting, they will attempt to set it ablaze on the roll of a six. The three hunters begin within six inches of the center of the board, and the Urukai are divided into four groups, with each moving onto the board from the center of one side. And with that, it's on to turn one, where the hunters take priority. All three move towards the closest group of Uruks to them, with Legolas only moving half so that he can shoot. The Uruks then surge forward, already moving as many of their forces as possible into contact with the building. Legolas then takes a shot on a scout who's reached one building, choosing to take one shot on a 2 plus in order to shoot past Aragorn, who's in the way. Hits on the roll of 5, but fails to wound. Turn 2 starts with the Uruks taking priority. A warrior and berserker charge straight into Aragorn, with the rest of the Uruks moving into contact with the nearest building, or as close as they are able to do with their full 6 inch move. Legolas then chooses to charge into two Uruks who have moved into contact with one building, and while Gimli can't quite reach combat, he also moves as close as possible and attempts to throw an axe into a scout, but misses on a 1. With no shooting, both Aragorn and Legolas choose to call heroic combats in order to try and take out as many enemies as possible. Aragorn goes first, but loses the fight, and chooses to spend two points of might from his store. However, he then fails to wound either of them, which means all that might was wasted. Hoping to do better, Legolas wins the fight with the six and pushes both of them back, which also pushes another scout out of contact of the house. In the end, Legolas also fails to wound either of the Uruks, meaning another might point down the drain. Ending the turn, we now start to roll to see if any houses are lit on fire. The first one has four Uruks touching it, and up it goes. The second has five, but it fails to light, and so does the third on the southernmost one. The Uruks once again take priority with one scout and two warriors charging into Gimli, while the rest of the others around them all moving towards the nearest house. The two Uruks who were fighting Aragorn choose to go for the house instead, and Legolas is surrounded by two warriors, a scout, and a berserker, with the others near him all moving towards the house closest to Aragorn. Being the only one not engaged, Aragorn turns and charges the Uruk closest to him, and then proceeds to call a heroic combat, winning on double sixes and killing the warrior on another six, before charging into another warrior and scout. However, Legolas isn't so lucky, and he not only loses the combat, but is trapped, allowing the Uruks to inflict five wounds on him due to his lower defense, and with only two wounds and three fate points, Legolas is killed outright. Gimli, on the other hand, manages to win the fight while using two axes and kills the scout. Finally, for Aragorn's second combat, he loses on a five, but chooses to might it to a six but he once again fails to wound either of the Uruks, leaving him with only one free might per turn going forward. Now, it's time to burn some buildings. There are now three Uruks, 
touching the house closest to Aragorn, but they don't manage to light it. The one near Gimli is lit on fire, but I did make a mistake here. There are actually only four that started and ended their turns touching it, but considering that they rolled three sixes, I think they still would have managed. With two houses now burning, Legolas dead, and being down to three might on the table, things aren't looking great for the hunters. The Uruks take it again, and most of them start moving towards the center tower with one charging Aragorn. Gimli, being the only hero left to move, turns and charges two Uruks touching the tower, missing his throwing axe as he goes in. Aragorn then once again uses his free might point to call up heroic combat, easily beating and killing the one Uruk he was fighting, before charging a Berserker. However, the Berserker turns around, wins the fight, and deals a wound to Aragorn that takes him two points of fate to resist. Gimli, seeing how desperate things are getting, calls up heroic combat and chooses to use his single double-handed axe which wins in the combat and kills both Uruks he was fighting. Charging into another two, he once again wins the fight with his two-handed axe and kills two more Urukai. But the turn isn't over as the four Urukai, still in contact with the house of the Uruborn, manage to light it on fire, leaving only the center tower standing. Incredibly, the Urukai again take priority, with almost all of them moving into contact with the tower, or at least towards it. Though two do charge Aragorn, and three pile into Gimli. Aragorn does manage to make up for last time, winning the fight and killing both enemies when the Berserker fails to save. Gimli, hot off a really good turn, decides to once again go for two-handed and wins the combat, but only manages to kill one Urukai this round. Only one Berserker was able to try and light the tower this turn, and luckily he failed. Finally, the heroes take priority. Everyone starts by charging two scouts, and Gimli charges the Berserker while tossing his axe, and not only manages to hit, but to kill the Berserker by spending one point of might. Then he proceeds to charge two other warriors, with the rest of the warriors piling into the tower. In the combat phase, Aragorn again calls a heroic combat, hoping to get as close as possible to breaking the enemy. He wins his first fight and kills two scouts. Then charges two warriors, but loses the combat with no might to save him, and takes a wound in the process. Gimli? Still feeling good, once again chooses his two-handed axe, but loses the combat. However, they weren't able to wound him. At the end of the turn, there are still 11 Urukai in the field, and four of them can try to burn down the tower. But they fail, meaning the game goes on. Back to form, the enemy again takes priority, with all the Urukai you can charging into the tower. Aragorn charges the same two warriors who wounded him before, and Gimli killed another warrior with his throwing axe before charging two more. Straight into combat, our heroes only need to kill two more Uruks to win the game, so Gimli goes full brute force with his double-handed axe and kills one more scout. Then. Aragorn rolls a six to win his fight, and kills another two with double sixes, winning them the game. And so, while most of the village is in flames and Legolas is wounded, the town lives to see another day. And the three hunters gather themselves and set off again to save their friends. So, that's my first solo game using these rules, and I did really enjoy it. I did fudge some of the rules here and there, but the places I did actually just kind of ended up making it harder for me as a player, so I think it was okay. So, 
Let me know if you've played any multiplayer war games solo, and let me know how it went. Also, how do you like the silent battle report? I don't know if this would ever be a regular thing, as it is a lot of work, but it is something that I am interested in maybe doing. I do have some ideas for kind of smaller narrative style games like this, so keep an eye out for that. I hope you're all staying safe, and once again, I'm Anders. Have a good one. So, announcement time. Basically, there's uh, two things I wanted to mention here. The first is I've, uh, I've actually started a Patreon, and it's active, uh, it's active now. Um, it's not really so much that I've started it, I've actually had it for quite a while as I've been thinking about doing a, a YouTube video for, for a couple of years now. So uh, I basically just, uh, I was watching um, the Battle Streams Middle Earth guys with uh, Damien and Steve and they were asking to, uh, they were talking about their new Patreon, so I went on to contribute to it and just, uh, yeah, just did it through my, uh, the one I already had, so I just, uh, did a little bit of an adjustment and uh, activated it, and now it's uh, it's there. Um, obviously, we're still pretty early in the days of this, so I'm not really genuinely expecting people to contribute now. It's mainly something to do for kind of self motivation. I've got enough videos now that I've kind of got under my belt that I'd like to be doing more and more consistently. So yeah, this is going to kind of act as hopefully a, uh, a motivator for for that and. Uh, so if you'd like to contribute, that's great. If not, I'm uh, at least going to help me to try to earn your your contributions through my own motivations. There's not nothing there though. I have uh, I've been I've put some posts about the about the videos I've done, and uh, the main thing though is I'm actually going to be putting a poll up there for uh, for specifically patrons only, um, and that kind of ties into the uh, the next thing I want to mention, which is uh, as soon as I start this Patreon, I'm actually going to be gone. Uh, out of town for the next uh, like three weeks, so I'm not really gonna be able to get any videos done. So what I've done is I want to be sure that when I get back, I kind of can hit the ball, hit the ball, hit the ground running, and just uh, get started immediately um, doing videos. So I put up a little poll, basically outlining. Uh, a couple of ideas uh, for videos so that you guys can vote on which you would like me to do. And uh, then I can start working immediately on those. They're all ones that I had been considering doing already, so it's just kind of about prioritizing and so that I know in advance, so when I get back, I can just uh, start them. So anyway, thanks again for your support. It's really great to be able to hitting kind of like a couple hundred uh, views here and there, and uh, yeah. Thanks again, and uh, have a good one.